Today what I'd like to go through is how we start to link field data with remotely sensed information. But to do this, what I'd like to do is to go through an example of using field data in a coral reef environment so I can give you an example of how we go about deciding what kind of field data we want to use to support the question that we have in mind. So just to give a brief overview of the coral reef environment that I will discuss in this context, um, I'm talking about Heron Reef. Okay, so this is just off Gladstone in Queensland and it's in the southern portion of the Great Barrier Reef. And the image that you see up there is a, is a mosaic of an airborne image. Um, and the data were collected um, twice, once at one metre resolution and once at four metre resolution. So I could have different spectral resolutions associated with those. So our four metre spatial resolution data, I got to have 30 spectral bands on it. But my one metre data, I could only have 19 bands. Okay, so that trade-off exists in airborne data as well as the satellite data that we've been looking at. So as a bit, as a bit of context to what the reef looks like, um, across ways from east to west we've got about 11 k's and 4 k's in the north-south direction. This is the, the island just here. So 800 metres by 400 metres, so quite small. So the majority of what you see there is reef. We've got some deeper water areas here in a lagoon and deeper off the actual reef edge as well. Okay, but to understand it a little bit more, what I'm going to do is take this slice out. As you can see, I've just twisted it sideways now. So to the right-hand side is north. And break down exactly what the components are that we're looking at. So if we were to take a cross-section of the reef in a schematic that's represented by our image above, we've got deeper water areas off each side of the reef crest, which is around here and also here. And that's where the majority of our live coral is, and that's, that's a nice place to dive. But so we know when we're going to create a map of the reef, for example, the majority of live coral is going to be just in these thin areas here. As you move up the slope, we come to a crest area. So this is the reef crest. It's dominated by a lot of rock and rubble. And that's, that's an area where you get a lot of wave impact. And at low tide, that will also be exposed, which allows us to have a lagoon area. So it, it's sort of like a swimming pool in the middle, if you like, because these portions at the edge will be um, exposed and that allows the internal part to dam in a way. So we do have some coral in this area, um, but a lot of it does get broken up quite a bit by wave action. Then it's a lot more sheltered when we come into the lagoon area. So we start to get these areas that you see in here, which are large coral bombies, and it's a mixture of a rock area with some coral and algae into it as well. Um, this part here that you see in the, in the green is, a, is an algal mat, so um, microscopic algae that lives in the sand and creates, uh, creates a nice tight mat just on the surface there. Uh, that's represented by this one here, so it's a cyanobacteria. Um, and same off the other side. Um, so in this particular example for Heron Reef anyway, the northern portion of the reef is a lot more sheltered. So it's the southern part that, that gets a lot, of the, a lot more weather. So the types of coral that you see on each side are a little bit different. But as an example as well, so down the bottom here, some live coral, some rock, rubble, the sand, which of course is really easy to pick up in the image as well, um, and some algae as well. When we look at reef environments, it's really important to understand what scale you're interested in looking at. So down the bottom here, if we're looking at the feature size on the y-axis here and the amount of heterogeneity in the environment, we look down the bottom here at zooxanthellae, which is chlorophyll essentially. So that's the way the, chlor the corals can photosynthesize and make their own food. So that's right down the really small part um, that we don't look so much directly at using remote sensing. Stepping up from that, we've got a polyp. Okay, so we're starting to build into the skeleton as well as the fleshy part of the coral. Then we can look at colonies or individual corals and then building that into patch reefs. Okay, so the, the combination of rock, rubble, algae and coral there as well. 
And then once you go from that, we can step up even further into actual geomorphic zones or entire reefs. So all of Heron Reef, for example, a reef province, the Great Barrier Reef, or the global distribution. So as you step at it, up at each of those scales, the types of features that you can map are different, but then the types of images that you need to correspond with that are different as well. Okay, so at the bottom we've got microscopic type stuff, then we'll step into, say, Iconos, Worldview 2, some Airborne, then we can move into Landsat, and up the top see with some MODIS. Okay, so you, you, your image types are different to match the scale of what you're looking at. But what I said for you guys at the beginning is we're going to revisit your scooper pages and a lot of your topics are really quite general. So comparatively here, if I was going to have a general topic, it might be coral reef remote sensing. But within that, there's so many different areas that you can look at. So you might be interested in reef geomorphology, the actual benthic habitat type, where are the areas of coral bleaching, or are you interested in the chlorophyll content of the reef? Can you see or quantify the amount of live coral cover? What's the temperature? What's the suspended sediment? Okay, so they're all individual questions within the scope of coral reef remote sensing. So your first task is going to actually be to revisit the topic that you put on Scoopit and consider is that the most specific um, identifier of the area that you're interested in looking at or can you focus it down a little bit more. So what I'm going to do is to go from this scale of looking at coral reef remote sensing which encompasses all of these different things but I'm going to say actually all I'm going to do is look at this topic here. So how, how do I map live coral cover? And specifically for this I'm going to look just at the field field techniques of how we get to that point because that's where I want you guys to get to later in this session. So just a bit more context, this is, this is an area of mixed live coral cover, there's a mixture of different things, so coral, sand, rock, algae, etc. And these are the different image scales that you can potentially look at. So we've got the airborne data which is what I'm going to talk through, um, some Iconos data at four meters um, and Landsat data as well. So you can really see that the challenge here is that there is a lot of heterogeneity in this environment here and how is that actually depicted in any of these images? So what can you actually extract? particularly if you look at Landsat, when you're only really getting one pixel or so in that particular area that you might be able to identify as some form of coral. So in terms of field work, for this particular project, when I'm looking at the ability to map live coral cover, there's a number of different ways that you can go about doing this. Okay, so you can go through the process of modelling and looking at collecting field spectra and using that for working with your image. But rather than show that aspect of the project, what I'm going to do is show the more simple aspect of doing really basic coral cover surveys. So if you like, this is really similar to what we did in the field on Friday in the savannah, but this time we're looking down and underwater. So it's really just about documenting what is where. So if you look at the reef here, we did a number of different transects and, and quadrats over a period of, couple of, ye of a couple of years to, to try to figure out exactly how much live coral cover there was across the reef amongst a couple of other projects. So you can see each of these individual yellow crosshairs, um, that was where we went down either snorkeling or diving depends on, depending on the depth of the time, um, lay out a transect line in, we did one directly out and then one um, in a cross to it, so perpendicular to it, so it looks like a cross. Um, and every meter took a photo of what was down um, on, the, on the substrate there. So that was those transects. Um, we, we did a number of grids, so these red dots here, which I'll show exactly what that means as well. And then we did some rapid surveys to cover large areas as well. So that's just hanging off the side of a boat with a, vo with a video camera in the water and taking a photo. So if you look at the different techniques here, so here's our, here's, our, here's our rapid survey technique. The boat goes along and every 50 metres you take a photo and that gives us broad coverage. And that's really good if you need to document large areas but not a lot of detail. This is our line transect. Okay, so taking a photo um, every two metres in this case. And then we come back to analyse those photos. 
Um, and the most detail of all, a grid which is five by five metres and taking a photo at every point along that. So we end up covering a 25 metre square area that we can then mosaic those individual photos into. Um, and just for reference as well, you can do the field spectrometry side of that, but like I said, I'm not going to cover that here. But really what we're trying to get at is trying to see if we can use any or all of these techniques together to map the live coral on the reef. So then once we've taken all the photos, what we do is to bring that back in the evening, download all the photos, and then put points over each photo. Okay, so in this example there's 12 points over the photo and all we would then go through is to figure out exactly what it was under each point and then enter that into a database. So for every single photo we then have reference for what the percentage of coral was at that particular site. Okay, based on what the GPS location is. Yes? So do I, do I move the grid points or do I randomise them or change them at all? No, so th there's a couple of different techniques for doing this and it's a, um, it's a trade-off between the amount of time that it takes and the data that you get out of it. So we did a lot of testing from deciding if you just take one point and, and put that say in the middle or anywhere, it doesn't matter, what's the, what's the amount of coral that you get all the way up until 30 points. And obviously doing 30 points takes you longer time. Um, doing one, one point doesn't take too long at all. But we looked at trying to figure out where it balances out between the number of points that you need to get a decent reference and 12 was the, the magic number in that instance. But we just kept it as a regular grid for simplicity. Is that within the one metre square image photo or is that within the so, so the question was, is this just in, in the one metre square photo? No, so things, things vary a little bit. So when you're in the, when you're in the transect or you're doing the, um, the grid survey, you can maintain a relative, um, relatively good height distance above the, above the substrate. And so we can work out exactly what the size of your photo is, just like you guys did in the class last week, figuring out your swath, swath width of, of the photo. So you can do that here. Um, for the boat one, because the depth varies quite a bit um, and therefore the, the height of the boat from the substrate is also varying, we would just take a depth reading at each, at each point. And so some photos would be quite detailed and some have a, have a broader swath, but then of course less detail. So ex that exact same trade-off. All you're doing is instead, instead of the satellite being in the sky, it's the boat on the surface of the water. But the same, the same context there, same concept there. So once we've compiled all that data, and bearing in mind that everything has a GPS location associated with it, it's possible to create a map of the individual field sites that we went to and assess the amount of coral at those particular locations. Okay, so that's just basic colour coding of each of the sites that we visited. And so the low coral cover areas are in that cyan type colour and the higher coral cover in the red. So that's just based with field data. But what we really want to do is to be able to translate that to image data. And so we used a, a bunch of different modelling techniques to do that, which I don't have time to go through in this class. But really what I just want to show is then how you use that field data to either calibrate or validate your mapping product. So you've got two, op two, two terms there, calibrate and validate. So when you are calibrating something, that's when you're using your field data to create some sort of model or map. And when you validate it, that's you testing the accuracy of your product at the end. So usually what we do when we go out in the field is to take double the amount of field data than we need. Half of it we use to calibrate our models and half we use to validate. Okay, and we want those to be independent samples and we randomly select those as well. So after doing the modelling on the, on the airborne hyperspectral data, this is basically what we come up with in terms of looking at the amount of coral within each pixel on the reef. Okay, so blue areas are low coral um, and the red areas are high coral. And it's quite difficult to see across the whole reef. 
Um, but if you look at this area here, so I've just zoomed into a small area within the lagoon, into these kind of cute Mickey Mouse ears that I like, um, and you can see the scale of heterogeneity even at that level, that each pixel is different to the one next to it, which is quite different to if you're going to do, say, a land cover classification and draw, draw a nice polygon around forest, you get a nice relatively large polygon. Whereas if you're looking at mapping coral cover because of the heterogeneity in the environment, you don't get that same level of smooth polygons here. So this is a quantitative image product, which means that within each pixel it has a particular value associated with a, with a real world unit. So in this case it's, it's a percentage value. If this was a thematic product, this would be a pixel is coral, the next pixel is sand. Okay, so that's you get those broad categories as opposed to a quantitative amount.